I'm expressing this concern or I'm asking a, this answer or, uh, or I'm consulting professionals about this. Do you know what? I just remembered. I didn't actually ask God. And uh, do you ever feel, well, you know, I've been asking a lot lately. Um, I perhaps exceeded my quota. <laughs> uh, it's important that we remember that, that, as I said earlier on, that God is willing and wanting to do more than we can ask or even think. We, you know, He's wanting to do things we haven't even asked for, we haven't even imagined yet. So uh, let's, let's be bold in doing that. So last week was um, Dare to Ask. So I guess this week we should call it Expect to Receive uh, as being consistent with that. So just a reminder, last week, remember we talked about that anticipation, that Position, what position to take. We talked about peeping over the wall. Remember? Do you remember that? Hands up, remember. Ooh, what? Ooh, that's good. Bet you can't remember the rest. <laughs> peeping over the wall. Smelling the sea air. Yeah. Anybody had a good sniff this week? Yeah? Smell the sea air. Uh, of course, we know all about anticipation. Uh... When I got here this morning, two of the grandchildren were outside and Josiah was telling me how many hours it is or how, many, how much time and they wish it was yesterday, tomorrow. And, you know, there, there was no shortage of anticipation. Uh, I wouldn't want us really to be anticipating Father Christmas more than we're anticipating the goodness of God, you know. Uh, but uh, if you live in my house, Anticipating Father Christmas starts early, <laughs> or, or about May. <laughs> yeah. So anticipation, we understand what that is. But I wonder if we understand, and this is where I want us to kind of come to this morning, that, that God wants us to live with, that, with a kind of anticipation, uh, an expectancy. Uh, an expectancy that something good is on its way. And so we carried on last week. We talked about the great work. Anybody been involved in great works this week? Hmm? Yeah? Yeah? You know, we talked about washing up and things like that. Yeah. Yeah. Anything that God gives us to do is a great work. Yeah? Anybody felt a little bit challenged about the attitude that they were having to what they, <laughs> what they had to do? Yeah. And if God's given it you to do, it's a great work. And uh, we can't determine greatness as this world determines greatness. We've got to determine it on the basis of what God says. And by the way, if God hasn't given it to you to do, you best not do it. Because the Bible talks about that as well. It says it's dead works. Dead works can look very good. But if it's not what God's given us to do, it's dead. It's a great work. And we talked about Nehemiah and, and building the wall. Expectation of something, looking ahead, believing something more, is actually, you, you think it's a good thing, but actually it's more than that. It's not an option. Because soberly, the Bible says... Where there's no vision, people perish. Uh, people cast off restraint. Uh, so it's a good thing, but the absence of it is actually a bad thing. It's not a neutral position. You know, where there's no sense of development, where we just settle where we are, where we say, oh, this is it. We get comfortable. It's very, very key that we understand it's in the plan of God that we are looking out, that we are peeping over the wall, that we are looking for the next thing, that we are seeking to see where he's going, understanding what he's doing so that we can be part of that and be involved in that. We talk there about vision. Let's say that vision is made up of faith, and hope and direction. 
And I want to talk a little bit about that. Let's describe that a little bit more. Because when I was thinking around these things, you probably already may realize this, but it was like the penny dropped. And I realized when I kept on talking about a Holy Spirit anticipation, something that, that stirs up within us, it's, it's something that God gives to us, I suddenly realized I'm talking about what the Bible calls hope. It's, it's just, I don't know, I, I sort of came at it in a roundabout way. Hebrews 11 tells us that faith is being sure of what we hope for. Of course, if you don't hope for something, it's very difficult to be sure of it, which means then there's not faith there. It goes on to say that, and certain of what we do not see. Hope says it can, faith says it will. Sometimes we get a little bit confused. This hope thing is very, very, very important. And that's where we are today. That's what I want us to, to be really catching hold of today, what we're going to ask God to help us. That, that this expectation to receive is very key. Hope says it can. Faith says it will. And that's the good thing. We described it, and I think we've got a little picture there, um, that uh, is, hope is like a rope. Say you were climbing up a rock. Mm, have you got one before that? Okay. There's, there's if you like, hope. It's, it's the rope under up which you could climb if you were climbing up a rock. I haven't done that for a little while, but, you know, if, it's, if you're thinking of doing that, rope's very, <laughs> very useful. Right. Without hope... Without the rope, there ain't going to be no going up the rock. All right? But then faith is pulling up it. That's the other picture. Thank you very much. Pulling up it. Actually, you need the one to have the other. <clears throat> Romans 8 verse 24 explains to us that faith might be the evidence, but hope is the expectation. So we're kind of building a picture of the vital necessity of hope. <sighs> well, I'm, I don't know. <clears throat> I'm, I'm not really a very optimistic person. Um, I, I find this very difficult. Uh, some people are optimistic and they're always looking out the right. Or uh, I always look on the bright side of life or well, you know, you've got to hope for the best. Hmm? Forget all that. All right? We're not talking about a natural thing. We're talking about a supernatural thing. See, we, we often think, well, faith comes as a, as a gift of God and it comes by hearing the word of God, all of which is true. But sometimes we think somehow we've got to work out and, and drum up from somewhere this thing of faith. Of th sorry, thing of hope. But in it, let's just look at this because in point of fact, it comes from the same place. We're talking about a supernatural hope, not about our natural disposition or different to our natural disposition, not looking on the bright side of life or any of those things. We're talking about something that God imparts to us, supernatural. Romans 15, verse 13. It's God that causes you to overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. We're talking about a supernatural work of God. I want us to be, as a people, moving more and receiving more of that supernatural download called hope. That we come into the place that he wants us. <clears throat> in essence, what happens is this. We place our hope in God. We're familiar with that. Lord, you are my hope. I'm trusting you. <clears throat> what we're not so familiar with is that he places his hope in us. So we hope in him and he places his hope in us. It's a work of the Holy Spirit. A very important work. So that means 
therefore, that God is not only the subject of hope, but he's the author of hope. He's the one who creates it, this supernatural hope. So, uh, you know, struggling to hope. Well, don't worry about struggling. Let's come back to asking. Lord, will you download this Holy Spirit anticipation, this expectation, which in your word you call hope, because I want to be receiving that from you. If faith sees what's not yet visible, it certainly hopes for what is not viable. And by the way, trust long before someone is reliable. A little quote that I picked up that Jamie passed to me the other day. Faith sees what's not yet visible. Hopes for what is not viable. It's all in that supernatural realm. And in this, is enabled to trust long before someone is reliable. It speaks of the love of God. <coughs> Hope feels... There's an expectation that something good is about to happen. It's like, if you like, you know, here I am, I'm sitting, and, uh, huh, hmm. But hope gets me off the seat, ready to peep over the wall. It's vital to the next stage that God has for us. Faith then sees what I've been feeling as I begin to feel things. I read that scripture earlier on. I want to take you back to it because it's important that we understand uh, the importance of the things that we communicate, you know, the things that we actually share together. This I recall to mind. Therefore, I have hope. It's like one of the gateways, one of the, one of the channels through which God places his hope in us when we begin to speak of who he is and what he's done, just as we did there. So let's use a story to look at Look at a process here, because that sometimes can be helpful. Acts chapter 27. For many of you, a well-known story. Paul on his way to Rome and uh, the shipwreck, which traces the, the particular things that, that work against hope, that, that suck hope out that destroy hope, and then, thankfully, the very thing that restores it back again. So here we are, there, he's uh, being taken to Rome uh, for trial, according to what he can claim as a citizen. And uh, let's jump in on the story. Uh, they're waiting for the... the uh, the wind to be in the right direction, the right kind of conditions. But they're waiting and waiting. In verse 9 of chapter 27 of Acts, it says, Much time had been lost, and sailing had already become dangerous. There was a, a frustration because of a, a slow progress. Now, follow through these things, because <clears throat> as we do, what I'm suggesting is that you be ready to identify things so, because this could then be God speaking to you about what needs to be changed or dealt with so that you might enter into what he has for you in terms of this question of hope. Frustration, slow progress, waiting for this to happen. Been waiting for such a long time. Wanted to get going. Just couldn't seem to. But Paul warned them, men, I can see that our voyage is going to be disastrous and bring great loss to ship and cargo. 
to our lives also. But the centurion, the person in charge, instead of listening to what Paul had said, in other words, instead of listening to the word coming from God through the man of God, he followed the advice of the pilot and the owner of the ship, he followed the advice of the experts. And great danger again there, listening to the experts as against listening to God's word. In fact, he went further than that. He said, since the harbour was unsuitable to winter in, the majority decided. Turn to the majority opinion. Okay, let's recap quickly. There was frustration because of the slowness. Wanted to get on with it. There was a refusal to listen to God's word, instead listening to the experts and then turning to majority opinion. And in the next verse, when a gentle south wind began to blow, hey, they thought they'd obtained what they wanted. So they weighed anchor, went along the shore of Crete. Problem was, they were looking at a natural circumstance. Ah, this looks a possibility. This looks good. They thought what they got. They thought they got what they wanted. But they were only viewing the very first step. They really actually wanted to get to Rome. But they were looking just at this first thing. They were looking at the thing from a natural point of view. They got a gentle south wind. And they needed to look beyond the waves and to hear and to see. And of course, then as the story goes on, before very long, a wind of hurricane force called the Northeaster swept down from the island. The ship was caught in the storm and could not head into the wind. So they gave way to it and were driven along. Contrary conditions came. So in, in addition to what had already happened, now they're facing contrary condition. I guess most of us could identify with a contrary condition. Uh, most of us have experienced the Northeaster uh, coming in our lives. And these things can have a profound effect. They couldn't head into the wind. Couldn't go against it. And verse 17, they tried hard to, to gain control. Um, Pass ropes under the ship to hold it together, uh, lowered the sea anchor, um, tried everything they could, but the ship was driven along. They're now in a situation where they feel that hope is, is, is definitely receding and they're being driven along in a way which was beyond really their control. Verse 18 says they took a violent battering from the storm and then began to throw things overboard to try and lighten the ship and so on and so forth. A violent battering can have a serious effect on our disposition, our opportunity to expect something different. So the long-term slowing down, the frustration, the turning aside to majority opinion, the picking up what looks might be the way, Try and fix something. And heading into the wind and then finding that the real storm was blowing. They did all they could, but it was to no avail. Verse 20 tells us, finally, we gave up all hope. They reached that place where they were no longer in hope. Hope had gone. As I said, what I want us to do is, is identify, are there any things which need to, we need to recognize? Wait a minute. These are drains. These are, th these are things which work against our place of hope, our place of expectation in God. We thought we're stuck. 
In fact, they didn't even think they could stay where they are. They couldn't maintain their position. Then comes the turnaround, the supernatural download. And we find it in verse 21. After the men had gone a long time without food, Paul stood up before them and said, men, you should have taken my advice. Cause them at that point to repentance. Cause them to turn again. Brings a word of hope. He brings the word of God. They turn again to the man of God. They begin to hear something different. The effect, of course, is that hope is restored when they return to the true source. Do not be afraid, Paul said. God has said that we will be saved, that we will, I have to stand trial before Caesar. Therefore, that's what will happen. In spite of all the other things that had happened that had drained hope, they came to a place where hope is restored. Hope is restored when we return to the true source. We need a restoration of hope. Is there something that God brings to mind? Think I, I need hope restored in this matter. Okay. Well, it's very simple. When God spoke, and they turned to hear him. They received hope again. Amen. So, what's, what's God saying to us? What are the actions for us? Those of us that are saying, you know what, I do want this Holy Spirit anticipation. I do want this thing the Bible calls hope. I do want this download from God. Well, we talked about uh, this from Lamentations, this bringing to mind this kind of giving thanks. That's very key and very critical. And it's kind of like, um, let's have that other picture. What we call priming the pump. Now, there's a, a discussion about ways in which this is done. Now, I'm not, uh, I'm not an expert on these things. Okay? Probably needs a scientist or something like that to tell me about it. But I do know this, that there's a requirement to prime the pump. You need some water in the first place. Yeah? And you hear the story of, you know, the man going across the desert, coming to the oasis, and there's a container of water, and he's so thirsty, and he wants to drink the water. But if he drinks the water, that's the water that has to be used for priming the pump. And if he will just use that in the way it was intended, then he gets the endless supply. I'm not quite sure whether it works like that here. I can't think of that. I think here it's more about creating a... Yes. Suction, vacuum. Yeah. It still needs to be filled with water. Right, okay. Good. I'd like a group to get together with Neil afterwards to discuss the scientific side of... The gas expand. I can come... Let's leave this for a minute. Let's get a science lesson, you know? All right. The point is... We use what we've got. And we begin to say, I lost hope for this, I lost hope for that. But I recognize that you are the God that healed me. You're the God that reached me when my, my heart was turned against you. We begin to actually thank God for who he is and for what he's done. Very, very key. Hebrews 10 encourages us not just to hold on to hope, but to um, spur each other, you know. Um, when Dawn was talking to us, she, she was saying about the, the, the um, infuriating thing that Jamie would say to her. Can you imagine Jamie being able to infuriate her? 
So what have you got to thank God for? You know, when, when you're not in the most positive place, to actually have somebody who cares for you enough to actually say, okay, I've heard all your woes and your troubles. What have you got to thank God for? It's a totally transforming thing when we begin to prime the pump, to begin to speak to God about what we have to thank him for. Yeah, we can list all our disappointments and all our woes and all our troubles, but there's something about when we begin. Nevertheless, I thank him. And you know what? When we begin to do that, we find that everybody has that opportunity of something to thank him for. So giving thanks, celebrating, priming the pump, actually encouraging, spurring one another. Hebrews 10 tells us to do that, to speak of hope and what he's done and what he's like and to, to testify of his nature. Hebrews 6 tells us that, that hope, this is an interesting picture, hope anchors us into the very person of Christ. It, it kind of goes beyond what he's done but into who he is. And, and you have to understand um, because we, we tend to think, anybody knows anything about boats, you tend to think about an anchor as we use anchors. And that is to hold you fast in a particular place. You know, when, uh, when a, a boat wants to stop in a particular position, it drops anchor, all right? But here we're talking about the anchor used for a different purpose. We're talking about sailing ships, not ships under uh, power in the, in the way that we have nowadays. So the anchor would be taken out to a particular place, rowed out in a small boat, uh, probably when they're coming in to, to moor somewhere or into port somewhere, and then they would basically pull on the anchor or uh, wind it on a capstan in order to actually use the anchor to, to gain the particular position. They'd be pulled into that position. So that's the picture here. You see, it talks about the anchor. Hope anchors us into the very person of Christ. See, it's not something that we could cast aside and say, well, you know, if you've got it, you've got it, and if you haven't, it doesn't matter. It's actually critically important. Malachi 3 encourages to speak of him and what he's done. So we're looking then for the steps we can take but primarily recognizing that hope is increased or given to us by the Holy Spirit, Romans 15, 13. And so <clears throat> the primary thing we can do is, you know what, Lord? I would like hope. Will you grant to me that Holy Spirit download that causes my anticipation level, my expectation level, the very thing that precedes faith to actually change. I ask you for that. I say, Lord, cause me to be hungry. Cause me to have an expectation. Grant to me that discontent, that Holy Spirit discontent. Help me to look beyond where I am. <clears throat> to look over the wall. Another good thing, we've touched on this, <clears throat> is to speak of hope. What we were just looking at in Hebrews 10. To speak of what, what are you seeing? What's stirring? Remember last week, I asked you to work together with me in this. To, to begin to consider what are you hoping for? What, what's stirring with you? What's, what's expectation? Have a little dream. You know, it's possible to dream your way into the mind of God and, and share it. I'd like to hear about it. You know, do an email, do a note. Very, very helpful. So what we say, we give thanks, we ask the Holy Spirit for increase, we speak of what we have and feedback and tell. To help us, <clears throat> as we come through this uh, 
Christmas time and we begin to move into the, into the next season and new year. We're going to concentrate on seeking God because that's what he's saying to us, seeking intimacy, seeking God for himself. You know, that's not just a kind of thing that floats up here somewhere. The Bible gives us what we call um, ways of accessing. Sometimes we talk about means of grace. It's about, you know, it's kind of like this. If you want to catch a bus, it's a good idea to go to a bus stop. Bus stop ain't going to get you anywhere, but it's a good step, good, good move to make, you know? What, are the, what is the equivalent of that? Well, it's as we come together to pray, as we share in the word, as we talk together the things that we're just talking about, the hope, the thank, thankfulness, the things that God said. They're the kind of things that, that help us. Uh, we go where Jesus is. Secondly, we want to major on Thanksgiving. When we come together in two weeks' time, won't, we won't do any teaching then. We'll just take a time where we, 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 one after another, give God thanks. Thank you, Lord. We just express that and we'll worship together and praise his name. Important. Then we'll come into the week of prayer. And during that week of prayer, we'll be seeking him and then seeking his way. Uh, as a key thing, uh, as he de begins to define and sharpen up our understanding of what he wants for us in coming days. In the meantime, right now, let's just come back and take a little time to spend in praising his name. Mark's going to come and lead us uh, as we recognize what a good God we've got. Amen? Recognize seeing you is key critical. We're going to hear what God's saying to us. We're going to pray as we continue in this time of worship. Um, you see, open the eyes of my heart. This is not about whether we've got the right wording or the right phraseology or we know how to put it. It's about us saying, Lord, see my heart. See this ache. See this where hope has gone. See where there's despair in place of hope. Because God doesn't bring us things like this without also confirming his word and restoring, doing the very thing that he says. God wants us to be a people that are not weighed down with a despair, but actually have an expectation of prepared, not battered by the storm, not not compromised by the Northeaster, so that they can actually be looking over the wall, look expecting something else.